I'm thinking about asking Brother Seth if he wants to go in with me and launch a, an official complaint against the pulpit makers of the United States. Um, there's obviously a prejudice. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to stand down here and look all of you right in the eyeball, if that's okay. Because if I go up there, you probably won't see me at all. God has blessed uh, Ada and I this year. We have moved to a new church. Some of you already know that. And I just want to thank God that, that we're at this new congregation. They've received us, and they're hungry for the truth. And I'm very thankful for them. And I just want to tell you all, I appreciate your prayers for us. I know a lot of you have been thinking about us and in our move and transition time. Uh, so we're doing very well, and I give the Lord thanks for all of His blessings. When Brother Bill talked about not being thankful, I thought, well, I, I need to be more thankful. And so I'm just thanking the Lord uh, in all of your presence for where we are now. These renewal sermons, if you've never preached at a renewal, it's always a challenge. It always stretches you as a speaker. I know many of you like to sit and soak it all in, and, and you are challenged, I know, by the different speakers and the different thoughts that you hear during the week, but maybe you don't know how challenging it is for those of us who speak. Every time when a renewal is approaching, and I know I have to prepare a message, I always want to come up with something, you know, really profound and really grabbing, you know, it's, it's a special occasion, and I know all of you are, are primed uh, to hear some explosive, powerful truth stated in perhaps a way that you've never heard before. And have you ever, those of you who preach and teach, have you ever sat down and tried to be profound? <laughs> you start writing things that even you don't understand. <laughs> and I kind of had that experience with, with, this, with this message. Uh, this is such a familiar passage. It's probably the most quoted passage in our century. It's been called the golden text of the Bible. Do I even need to read it to you? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So, I'm not going to try to be exceptionally profound with this passage. I'm not going to try to give you some novel new spin or twist on this text. I don't think I need to do that. I think that this text has its own profundity. And I want to try to communicate it to you just as it is to the best of my ability. I am convinced that sometimes what God's people need when we come together like this to listen to the Word of God being taught and preached and expounded, most of the time what we need anyway is not some new truth. Most of the time what we do when we preach and when we meet together is to uh, remind one another and to affirm old truths that we should never let go of, that we should never forget. Recently I've been trying to read the Old Testament through more than I have in the past. And I noticed a little pattern. I'm, I'm about three-fourths of the way through the Old Testament this year. And I noticed a pattern. You know, after the, the, what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law, or of Moses, there's not a lot of new stuff. What really happens in the rest of the New Testament is you keep reading over and over again the same things that you read back there in the five books of the law. It's like God is just reminding them, I am God, beside me there is no other. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You go, you go right through the prophets and that's the, that's the message that keeps getting repeated over and over again. Sometimes what God's people need is not so much a profound new truth, as much as a good reminder of an old truth that we should never let go of. And even when you turn to the New Testament Scriptures, the, the theme is similar. There are things that are repeated over and over again. We need to be reminded when Jesus, on that night, that fatal night, before He was betrayed, and when He took bread, and He broke it, and He gave it to them, and He took the cup, and He said, this do what? In remembrance of 
of me. There are some truths that we just need to be reminded of because we should never let them go. And so when I, when I preach this passage tonight, I'm not going to try to be profound. I'm not going to try to make some novel spin on it that you've never heard before. These are things that you've, you've heard before. You've heard this text before. You remember that old Corn Flakes commercial? Taste them again for the first time. Well, that's what I want you to do with John 3.16. I want you to hear it and taste it again for the first time. This passage is familiar. In some ways, John 3.16 might suffer a little bit from over-familiarity. We may take this text kind of casually simply because we've heard it so much. It might seem to be a text that is, that is sort of maybe, a, maybe a, a, an entry-level text. A, a, a child's text, you know, that, that's something the kids need to memorize. That's something I've, I've, I've already heard. And so this text does suffer a little bit, I think, from, from over-familiarity. It also suffers, I think, from being taken out of context a little bit. A lot of times when this passage is quoted or memorized or preached upon, you only hear the 16th verse. You don't hear the other verses that are around it. And John 3.16 is... As precious and as powerful as that verse itself is, it is in a, a rather important context. It's part of a larger discourse that begins in verse 1 of chapter 3 and goes all the way through about verse 21. You know how John 3 starts out, don't you? A man named Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. There's this little exchange about something about being born again being born of the Spirit. The whole passage is, a, is sort of a, a contrast. It's a context of contrasts. Spirit, flesh, belief, unbelief, earth, heaven. See these contrasts. Uh, life, perishing. It's a context of, of contrasts. Maybe you didn't know this, maybe you hadn't picked up on this, but more than likely what we have in this passage beginning in the 16th verse is actually a, an inspired apostolic commentary on what Jesus said in verse 15. More than likely, verses 1 to 15 are the actual quotation, the words of Jesus. And then beginning in verse 16, what you have is an inspired apostolic commentary on what Jesus had just said, especially in verse 15. Remember what he said in verse 15? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And it's almost like John the evangelist, the apostle, said, Oh boy, I can't leave that alone. <laughs> I've got to say something about that. And so you see a little switch. There's, a, there's the past tense is used in verse 16. John is looking back upon Jesus' words after Jesus has already been through the cross. He's already been lifted up on the cross. He's already been lifted up into heaven. And so John is giving a sort of inspired commentary on those words there in verse 15 when he says, For. You always want to know what the therefore is there for. And in verse 15 he says, Jesus himself said, the Son of Man must be lifted up. And John says, for God so loved the world. And then, then comes our, our text. What we have here in, in this little verse is a succinct statement of the entire gospel. At pretty much everything is there. You've got a statement there about the danger that we were in. We were, we were all snake bitten, you see, just like the old Israelites back there. By, this, by sin, we were all sick and dying, we were going to perish. We have in this passage a, a, something about what God did to rectify that situation. God has offered us a remedy for our sickness. We have what we must do to appropriate that remedy. And we have the glorious results of, of appropriating God's remedy. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. There are perhaps a couple ways that we can understand exactly what is being said in this passage. You could understand it something like this. You could translate it something like this. God so loved the world and he demonstrated that love by giving his son. If you go in that direction, Romans 5 sort of becomes a commentary on John 3.16 because it says in Romans 5, as uh, you've already heard this week, that God demonstrated his love. While we were yet enemies, 
God demonstrated his, his love for us by Christ's death upon the cross. So we can understand John 3.16 is the, the so loved equals the cross. And I think that's certainly true. We could understand this passage to be saying uh, something like this. Because God so loved the world, because he loved the world, he gave his son. In other words, the giving of the son is the product, the result of God's love for the world. Now, do we have to choose between those two options? I don't think so. I think they're both equally true. You see, in salvation, God's love is revealed, and the origin of salvation is also the love of God. So both of those things are, are equally true. At the center of this entire statement, this entire context here in John 3, is the wonderful love of God for the world. I couldn't help, uh, I think this has already been referenced, but I couldn't help but thinking when I read, for God gave, I couldn't help but thinking of, think of Abraham and Isaac. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. Abraham and Isaac going up Mount Moriah, and the angel finally stopping the hand of Abraham before he slays his one and only son. Remember there in the passage, it's called, he says, take your son, your only son. Well, guess what? Abraham didn't have to slay his only son, but God did slay his only son. Now, some folks have read this passage that says, God so loved the world, and they have said, now surely that can't mean what it says. God loved the world? The world. Surely it can't mean <laughs> that God loved the world. It can't mean that. And so some people who have some theological axes to grind have said what that really means, the world that God really loved, uh, was the world of the elect. It wasn't the world, everybody. It was the world of the elect. Only the people that God had uh, predestined that he knew would believe the people that he was going to, to give the gift of faith to because after all, why would God waste his love on the, the rest of sinful humanity that was going to go to hell anyway? Why would God waste a drop of blood, a drop of the blood of his son on, on a world that's not going to believe, that's going to go to hell anyway? Of course, that little position is sort of blown to bits by the word whoever. <laughs> For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him so it can't the world can't mean the world of the elect only because of that little word whoever there in the passage what we actually have here is God writing us a blank check whoever you can just write your name right in there you can just replace God so loved the world just just put your name just put your name right in there. And, and you've got to think about it that way. You've got to make this very personal. Just put your name right in there. And receive what the Lord has given you. He loved all the world because he loved each one of us. Now, I could say I love America. I love my country. I'm very patriotic. I could say that. But when I, if I said I love America... Does that necessarily mean I love every single citizen of the United States? Probably not. But when God says that he, when the scripture says that God loved the world, it does mean that he loved each one of us individually. It's a blank check. You can put your name, you can put your name right in there. Now, another thing that has caused a little bit of confusion about the meaning of this text is that there's another text written by the same author over in 1 John chapter 2 that tells us not to love the world. Do not love the world. And you might ask the question, now wait a minute, why would God love the world and then turn around and tell us not to love the world? Well, here's the, here's the answer, and it's, it's so simple you might kick yourself. When God loved the world, he, loved, he didn't love it with a selfish participation in its wickedness. See, we're, when we're told not to love the world, we're not to love it so as to participate in that wicked system. But God can love the world not with the selfish love of participation. God loved the world with a selfless act of sacrificial love. 
in order to redeem it. So that's how I would deal with that little, perhaps, incongruency there, which isn't really an incongruency in the Word of God. Amen. For God so loved the world. We have to wrestle a little bit with the meaning of that word world. What does it mean? What is the world that God loved? Now, I've already told you it, it doesn't mean just the world of the elect because of the word whoever there in the passage. But what is the meaning of the word world here? Well, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to know that whatever world means, it's probably not something good. Right? Uh, you don't have to know any Greek to, to figure that out pretty quickly. The world is an unworthy object of God's love. If, if the world was something good, you understand if God loved the world because it was so nice, well, that just doesn't make any sense. Why would He need to give His Son? What's all the stuff about uh, being lifted up there in the passage? That, that doesn't make any sense at all. There's nothing in the world that was so good, God just... Had to love it. No, that, that can't be it at all. The world is an unworthy object of God's love. Amen. Let me just define what the world is just in one little statement here. The world is the mass of sinful, alienated, rebellious, fallen humanity. Amen. Is that enough adjectives for you there? They say the more education you get, the more adjectives you used. You use. That's what the world is. The world is the mass of sinful humanity. God so loved the world. That's what it means. Every time in the Word of God, when the word world is used, in this sense, it's used to represent hostile, alienated humanity. Humanity in rebellion against God. It can't mean that God loves the earth, the created order, in that sense. That, that wouldn't make any sense at all. So that is what the word world means. Now again, you, 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 just, you just step back and say, can God really love that? Can, I mean, this text, if you didn't know it was in the Bible, you might think there's some heresy going on here. You mean God loved the world? That alienated, rebellious, hostile system, uh, that, that place that's, that's ruled by Satan who is called the God of this world. God loved that world, Paul has a little commentary just to enlighten us a little more about the nature of this world that God loved. In Romans 3, Paul does a little autopsy here on the human race. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. This is a commentary, see, on world. There is none who understands there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. I, I think the scripture puts that in there, that emphasis, because sure shoot, somebody says, you know, somebody says, a preacher says, there's no one that's good, and somebody thinks, yeah, except for me. And it's like, there is no one who does good. Not even you. Right? Not even you. Not even me. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It's a little autopsy of the human race. Amen. And you've you got to ask again, God loved that? God loved that world? Did he really? It's easy for us to stand back and say, you know, we love to do this. Christians love to do this. We love to get together and talk about how bad the world is. You know, everybody has to do that. Oh, it's getting bad. Getting bad out there. Never been any worse than it is now. Of course, that isn't true. But that's what we like to say. Oh, it's bad. World's bad. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever sinned? Well, thanks a lot. You've added to the problem. We have all added to the problem. We can't separate ourselves and sit back and say, oh yeah, that world. We, we've all been in that world. 
we're all part of the problem. Every time we ever sin, we added to the corruption. We added to the decay. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were part of that world. Thank goodness we were part of the world that God loved. But nevertheless, we were part of that world. The scripture says we were delivered. When you came into Christ, you were delivered from this present evil world. Thank God. Amen. We can be delivered from it. We're no longer a part of it. When it goes down, we're not going to go down with it. And it is going down. It, it is going to perish one day. Is that really the world that God loved? Another thing I can tell you is that nothing in humanity, nothing in that world brought forth the divine love. There, were no, there was no inherent goodness in us. The only thing that brought forth the divine love was our own need and our helplessness. God did not look at humanity and consider our wonderful potential. You know, some people may think that, that God so loved the world means that He looked at humanity. You know, we hear songs all the time about God looking past the sin and seeing the, the, the person's potential or something like that. That's, a, that's something that, that sounds really good. That, but, but that's not the case. That's flawed thinking because you, you don't understand... I, People don't understand, I think you all understand this, but folks don't understand how ruined the human race really is. Yes. It's ruined. In fact, one of, the, one of the meanings of the word perishing in our text, could be, it could be translated ruined. Like a bunch of rotten fruit. We don't understand how, how much, what a number sin has done on the human race. God did not look at the human race and consider our potential. That's not why he loved the world. There was nothing inherent within us that called forth the divine love and made God love us. To where God had said, I just, I just can't help myself. I have to love those, those people. No, not at all. There was nothing in humanity that brought forth the divine love but our need and our helplessness. And by the way... This is the only sense in which God's love is unconditional. Now, at this point, I, I want to I try to summarize Brother Mike's sermon and connect it to what I'm saying in about two sentences. Okay? The only sense in which God's love is unconditional is in the sense that we can do nothing to earn what our text is talking about. There was nothing that we did, there was nothing that we were inherently within ourselves that merited or compelled God to love us Amen. and to send His Son into the world to give His Son to die for us. That's the only sense in which God's love is unconditional. And understand here, I'm not contradicting anything Brother Mike said, I'm just adding my, putting it into my own words. He talked about my text, so I'm going to talk about what he said. <laughs> you see... God's love in that sense, if you want to use the word unconditional, which is really, really, folks, when people say that God's love is unconditional, this is pretty much what they mean. They mean that I did nothing to merit God's, God's love or the, the sending of his son into the world. But it's a sloppy way of thinking. It's, and that's what Brother Mike was, was telling us in his message. To say God's love is unconditional... Kind of, it's just a sloppy way of thinking. It has opened the door for people to use John 3.16 and the truth of the love of God is sort of like a big, fuzzy, warm blanket. And they just pull it up and say, oh, God loves me. Doesn't make any difference what I do. I'll just continue in my sin and ignore Christ. God loves me. You see, the only sense in which the love of God was unconditional was that there was nothing in humanity that brought forth his love. But in order to benefit from God's love, there is a condition. There is a condition. And I'm going to come back to that here in a minute in this message. Really, when I read in this passage that God so loved the world, of course, as Brother Mike said in his message many times, it doesn't mean that God had warm fuzzies for humanity. It doesn't mean any kind of, of silly, romantic, emotional uh, kind of love. When I read love in this text, I think of it more in terms of compassion. Like when Jesus saw the crowds coming to them. And it says that they were harassed and helpless. He had compassion on them because they were harassed. Yes. 
and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. I believe it was a compassionate kind of love, a, a pity that he had for us in our state of need, in our state of lostness and darkness and ignorance and alienation and rebellion. He could have destroyed us. He could have given us what we deserve. But he had compassion for us. And he sought to do something about our situation. He sought to meet the need that we had instead of wiping us out or ignoring that need. Amen. Why does he love the world? Why does he love us in this condition? Why, why does he do that? Well, he's just that kind of God. God is love. There's something in God's nature that he's just this way. Yes, he's a God of justice and a God of wrath. I'm going to talk about that in my own way in just a moment. But there's something within God, something about His nature. He's not obligated to love us because of any inherent goodness within us. He just loves us because that's just the kind of God He is. He's, God is love. Not only was there nothing in humanity to bring forth the divine love, but there was much in humanity to repulse God. Amen. Folks, we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. There was a lot of reasons for God not to love the world. There was every reason for Him not to love the world. I think we, we often don't, don't get this because it's, it's very easy for us not to take our own sin very seriously because we're, we're sort of immersed in the world. And, and we, we often make light of sin because we fail to think of sin in light of who God is. We tend to compare ourselves, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. But we often do not compare ourselves to who God is. God is impeccably holy. That's why it's such a startling statement to read in the Word of God that God so loved the world. When you consider the holiness and the righteousness of God, it's amazing that this statement is even in the Bible, that he loved the world. You see, in a sense, now, th this is a weird statement to make about God, but I hope you'll understand what I'm trying to say. Human language sometimes fails with these things. But in a sense, if you can get this and receive this, it was hard for God to love the world, if, if, if it's possible for anything to be hard for God. It wasn't easy for God to love the world. And that's another statement that I'm going to come back to. So just tuck that away in the back of your mind. We'll bring it up again. There was many reasons for God not to love the world. Here's just sort of the bottom line. The world deserved to be destroyed. That's what it deserved. The world deserved destruction. Someone once asked Martin Luther what... Martin Luther, what would you do if uh, you were God? What would you do to this old sin-sick world? And Luther replied rather honestly, if I were God, I would probably have kicked this world to pieces. Well, I'm glad Martin Luther wasn't God. And I'm glad I wasn't God and that you're not God. But God didn't kick the world to pieces. That's what it deserved, but that's not what he did. He didn't destroy it. He devised a way to save it and to bless it. Now remember I just said a moment ago it was in a way it was hard for God to love the world. Let me explain that in this way and get down really to what I want to say in this message. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God's love for the world would cost him very dearly. There's nothing cheap, there's nothing simple, there's nothing casual, there's nothing light about God loving the world. God's love for the world would cost him very dearly. I think that's the main thrust of John 3.16. The cost of God's love. Do you realize what a precious commodity the love of God really is? What do I mean when I say that God's love for the world would cost him dearly? I mean, first of all, that his love for the world prompted him to become weak and vulnerable. Now, any of you who has ever loved another human being, you know what this means. To love 
is to attach yourself to someone else and the very act of doing that makes you, in a sense, vulnerable. When you love somebody else, you make yourself exposed to getting hurt by that person, to getting disappointed by that person, to perhaps being rejected and abandoned by that person. The only way to avoid all the risks of love is to not love at all. To not give love and not receive it. Just build a big steel wall around your heart and you'll never get hurt. <laughs> you see, when God loved the world, He exposed Himself, if I can speak as a man, to, becoming, to being hurt by humanity. He became weak and vulnerable. Now, we, we like to think mostly about God being powerful. And he certainly is powerful. And I'm not taking anything away from the, the power of God. But in John 3.16, we don't read about God's power. I'm going to say that it wasn't God's power that saved us. It was God's weakness that saved us. You see, in the incarnation of Christ, God became weak and vulnerable to the world's hostility and abuse. You realize when Jesus came into this world, he knew what was going to happen. And he came anyway. He told his disciples, the world's going to hate you just like it hated me. I, I didn't exactly go for all of the violence in the passion of Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. But one thing that film did for me, it did help me think about the suffering of Christ. And what he subjected himself to. They, they beat him and they struck him and they pulled out his beard. And, and it, this, you know, he, we sing that song, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. He didn't. He didn't do it. He, he submitted to that. It's, it's unbelievable. He submitted to suffering for us and for our sins, though he could have been released from it. He didn't have to do that. That's what the drama in the garden was all about. He willingly put himself in that position to receive the world's abuse and hostility. He emptied himself. Philippians chapter 2, which I think has already been quoted here. That little passage there in Philippians 2 is a wonderful commentary on the love of God, isn't it? Amen. Being in the very form of God. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. He did, Jesus didn't hold on to his position in glory. Amen. He made an incredible journey from the glories of heaven into this earth, an earth that loved darkness instead of light. John says right there in our passage. What an incredible... You see how far God went to save us? Amen. Nothing, folks, is cheap and easy about the incarnation. Nothing is cheap and easy about salvation. Nothing is cheap and easy about God's love for the world. In order to save us, God had to become weak and vulnerable to the world's hostility and abuse. And of course, his ultimate moment of weakness was when he was lifted up on the cross. Paul said he was crucified through weakness. That was his weakest point. You know what, though? The, the foolishness of the cross is, is really seen in this. In God's loving embrace of weakness, His weakness proved to be more powerful than all the darkness in this world. It, Jesus won the victory through the power of love at His weakest point. It was in His weakest point. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians there, the cross is foolishness to the world. They don't understand that kind of thing. It was the power of love. Love is a powerful force. God's love compelled him to become weak, but God's love in and of itself is not weak. It's not a weakness. God's love is powerful. You see, God's love isn't soft on sin. It's just the opposite. God's love is able to overcome sin and overcome alienation. And that's exactly what he did on the cross. The love of God has transforming power, as has already been expounded this week. But I do want to make this point 
The love of God is not soft on sin. I want to make this very, very clear. Something had to be done about man's sin. When it says God so loved the world, it doesn't at all mean that he just sort of loved us in sort of a condescending way and just sort of patted us on the head and said, oh, that's okay. I love you anyway. No, 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 not at all. Something had to change. We were on a path to destruction. We were going to perish, and it would not have been very loving of God to let us perish. Amen. See, people in the world have it all wrong when they think that God's love is just that He tolerates everything. God would not be very loving if He just tolerated us going to hell and perishing. He wasn't going to stand by and let us die in our sins. Love met us at the point of our greatest need. Amen. And that's my second thing here. God's love cost him dearly. That means that his love for the world prompted him to become a substitute for sinners. When it says that God gave his son, it means more than just the incarnation. It ultimately is pointing to the cross. The gift of the Son implies a sacrificial death. When it says God gave, it's talking about the cross. It's talking about the atonement. You see, you cannot look at the cross and, con and conclude that God doesn't really care about sin. You can't do that. The cross very obviously illustrates the gravity of sin and what God thinks about sin. You can't have a kind of a mushy view of the love of God if you connect it to the cross. You can't. When Jesus was there on the cross, something was being revealed about God like had never been revealed Amen. before. You see, the Son was lovingly given by the Father. That's what our text says. For God, the Father, so loved the world, He gave His his son. You know, there are, there are views of the atonement, there are theories of the atonement that I often hear expounded that would make you think something like this. It would make you think that up in heaven there's this angry, vengeful deity who's just waiting for the first opportunity he has to send you to hell and that along came our friend Jesus and Jesus went up to God and is kind of holding God back, you know. Kind of like Moses with the Israelites, you know, don't destroy them, don't wipe them out. And, and so Jesus is our friend, but God is this angry, wrathful deity. You don't see that in John 3.16. Amen. That is not an accurate picture of the relationship between the Father and the Son. Amen. Both Father and Son were in unity in this purpose. Amen. The, the, it says God loved the world. And he didn't have to kick Jesus out of heaven. The, Jesus was united in purpose with the Father. They had the same mind on this thing. They were united in this mission, in this purpose. And the Son submitted himself to the Father and willingly carried out the Father's uh, pur purpose and intention. The Son submitted to the Father. That's the picture we have here in John 3.16. The Father's gift of love did not contradict his justice either. There is no... God is not fighting with his own nature. There's no struggle within the, the nature of God between his wrath and his love, or his love and his justice. God is one. There's no struggle here at all. People that have problems reconciling the wrath of God and the love of God, the justice of God and the love of God, they, they, just, they just don't understand. It is because, precisely because he loved us, that he would not and could not ignore our sin. Amen. He would not have been loving if he had just patted us on the head and let us go on our way to perdition. Amen. Sin is a destructive force, and God was, wanted to do something about it, to save us from that, from that destruction. Amen. And he dealt, with it, he dealt with sin effectively through Christ on the cross. You see, in the cross... The justice of God and the love of God are both clearly revealed. Amen. It's like that old song that righteousness and, and uh, peace or something like that have kissed each other. It's like right, the, God, the righteousness and the justice of God and the wrath of God and the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God was all perfectly harmonious and united when Jesus was on the cross. Amen. 
And this is exactly what Paul talks about in Romans 3, by the way. God lovingly provided a way for us to be delivered from his wrath. That's what that word propitiation means in Romans chapter 3. The Son, Jesus, was a propitiation, one who turns away the wrath of God. Why did God do that? Why did God make His Son, have His Son become a propitiation for our sins? Because He loved us. His love provided that propitiation. His love provided a way for Him to love sinners and forgive their sins without being unjust. And of course, we know from Brother Mike's sermon, the only way that, that he can do that is in Christ. Understand? Amen. The only way he can love you and forgive your sins and still be just is if you have faith in Jesus Christ. That's Paul's teaching there in Romans 3, which is such a profound thought. I mean, I got, I got, to, I got to tell you, it's one of the most profound thoughts I think I've ever had is how God in His wisdom, in His mercy, and love, and grace, and also in His justice, can at the same time on the cross satisfy both of those aspects of His nature. Isn't that marvelous? Amen. Amen. What a wise God we serve. Amen. Amen. So the, the Father's gift of the Son did not contradict His justice, and the love of the Father is defined by the Son's sacrifice. Now this point has been gone over again and again. I'm not going to, to belabor this very much, but as we've already heard before, we cannot, folks, we cannot accept worldly definitions of love. Especially worldly definitions of the love of God. The, the current popular definition of the love of God is tolerance. That He just tolerates everything. And I know that you all can see through that. I don't, I don't have to, to belabor that point. I do want to say this, though. And I, I've had to modify this a little bit in light of Brother Ingram's sermon. But I, 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 whatever you want to do with the Greek, okay? Agape, phileo, whatever you want to do with those words, and Brother Jonathan's exposition of that was fabulous. But, but whatever you want to do with those words, if you don't know any Greek, and if you never want to know any Greek, <laughs> Brother says it's going to kill me for saying this, but that's okay. You can still understand the love of God by looking at the cross. And I'm going to make the bold statement that the primary way to understand the love of God is not etymologically, it's doctrinally. Amen. It's theologically. You have to get close to the cross. Amen. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Amen. If you ever forget about what love really is, if you ever forget about how to love, if you have questions about, am I really a loving person? Am I really exercising a godly kind of love? Well, the standard is the cross. That's, right. Amen. That's how God demonstrated his love. And if you're going to love like God, you've got to love in a selfless, sacrificial way like he loved. That's how you can sort of measure the love in your life. All right, if you want to know, am I really a loving person? But go back to the cross. Compare your, compare your love to, what, to the kind of love. I'm not saying you're going to have to die for anybody physically like, like that. But you compare your love to the principle that was demonstrated there at the cross. So if we need a reminder of how we should love, we should think and talk a lot more about the cross of Christ. Now this sacrifice that Jesus offered on the cross must be appropriated. It must be appropriated. To appropriate something means to take advantage of it. To, to apply it to yourself. Uh, appropriating, like when you get sick, you go get some medicine... Uh, you have to appropriate that medicine before it will do you any good. The sacrifice of Jesus must be appropriate. That's why, as Brother Mike was saying, the love of God is conditional in this sense. Yes, He loved the world, but you won't benefit from it unless you personally apply the atonement to your own life. Amen. There's the condition in the love of God. To benefit from the love of God, you have to personally believe in Jesus Christ and apply his blood to your life. Right there in our context, there's a little reference to a, a, a story in the Old Testament. Remember that story when Israel was out in the wilderness and they were just rebelling against God? And it says God sent a bunch of poisonous snakes in among them and it bit a whole bunch of them. And they were all dying and they cried out to Moses and Moses cried out to God and God told Moses to, to make a serpent, cast a serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up and anybody that looked would live. Yeah. 
You know? I think you folks from Indiana used to sing a song, Look and Live. <laughs> look and live. If, if anybody that was snake bit and dying looked at that serpent, God promised them if they looked in faith, they would live. That's what you have to do with the atonement. That's what you have to do with Christ. You, see, we're all snake bit, folks. We're all perishing. That, that poison of sin is running in our veins, and it's going to get you someday. To benefit from God's love, you've got to look, and then you'll live. That's what our text says, isn't it? For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever, where's the condi what's the condition? Believe. Believes in Him will not perish, but will have eternal life life. Look and live. There's a story about uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. When he was just a young man, before he was a Christian, he uh, happened to visit this little Methodist church on a very stormy, snowy Sunday night, I believe. And he walked in, there was a lay preacher speaking, and the lay preacher preached on the text, I think it's from the prophet Isaiah, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. And that's the text that saved uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, went on to become one of the greatest preachers in Christian history. Look and live. That's the principle. That's what you have to do to apply the, the, the benefit of the love of God. Faith is your lifeline to heaven. Belief is your, like your lifeline. That's how all the benefits of Christ's atonement, that's how all the benefits of the love of God come to you personally, is by believing having faith, trusting, leaning heavily upon the Son of God. The old uh, Scottish preacher Alexander McLaren had a sermon on John 3.16. And in that sermon he used a very interesting analogy that I think perfectly explains this passage. He used the analogy of a lake, a river, a pitcher, and a drink. And he said, you see, the love of God is like the lake. Vast. Christ is like the river, moving the water to where we are. Faith is like the pitcher that dips a scoop of the water, and eternal life is like a cool, refreshing drink. You see? You see the progression? The love of God won't benefit you. It wouldn't have benefited any of us if He hadn't sent His Son. It still won't, even though He sent His Son, it won't benefit any of us today unless we take that pitcher of faith and take a drink. You have to apply, what I'm saying is you have to apply the atonement in order to benefit from the love of God. That's the condition here. And I'm going to try to come to a, a conclusion here eventually. Folks, God's love for the world cost Him dearly. That's what I want you to take away from this. And it's the enormity of that cost on the, that, that Jesus went through on the cross. It's the enormity of the cost that emphasizes the greatness of God's love. Amen. God's love is great and vast. And we know that because we know the, 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 in, the incredible nature of what Jesus did for us there on Calvary. I heard a story recently about a young man who had become very rebellious against his parents. He had become sort of a modern-day prodigal son, had left his home and had gone off and lived a wild life. And like the prodigal son, eventually he hit rock bottom and decided he needed to go home and get his life back together. But he, he was afraid to go home because he thought his father would be angry with him and wouldn't let him come home. So he called his mother and he said, Mom, I want to come home. I'm ready to come home. And, but I'm not sure about Dad. So here's what I want you to do. If it's okay for me to come home, if Dad's going to receive me, I want you to tie a white handkerchief on the limb of the old oak tree out in front of the house. That way I'll know it's okay to come in, that there's going to be peace and acceptance. So on the way in the car, he just couldn't stand it anymore. He, he called, he got out his cell phone, he called his, his friend that lived up the road from his parents' house. And he said, listen, I want you to go out and I want you to look at my front yard and see if there's a white handkerchief tied in the limb of the big oak tree. He said, the friend said, okay. So he went out and he looked, came back and he said, well, is there a handkerchief tied on the limb? And his friend said, man, there's a handkerchief tied on every single limb. <laughs> John 3.16 is like God tying a white handkerchief on every single limb of the tree. It's okay, the prodigal can come home. There's atonement, there's forgiveness, there's acceptance. Amen. I want to just add in here very quickly, this has not been mentioned. 
yet, and I want to mention this and throw this out for you to think about without developing it a lot, but God's love has degrees of intensity. Yes. Now, God loved the world, but he didn't love the world like he loved Jesus. And God loved the world, but he didn't love the world like he loves Christians in Christ. Those of us who are his sons and daughters by faith in Jesus Christ. God's love has degrees. Folks, God did not want you to perish. He was not going to stand idly by and let us slip into perdition. He was willing to do what needed to be done in order to rescue us and save us from destruction. And folks, his love went farther than just rescuing us. He wants to share his very self with us. That's what eternal life is. Most people think eternal life is just living forever. No, it's being in fellowship with God. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life to know God and His only Son whom He has sent. God wants to give us his, of His very self forever. We can enjoy Him. You see, He went much farther than just rescuing us from perdition. He doesn't just want to save us from hell. He wants to give us heaven. Amen. One of the most fascinating books I've ever read is the book by C.S. Lewis called The Great Divorce. And you, you might have to excuse a little bit of the underlying theology there that Lewis had, but it's a story, a, a made-up story, of course, about a group of people that get to go down a bus and go from hell to heaven. And while they're in heaven, uh, they get the opportunity, if they want to, to stay in heaven. There was one a little part of that book that I found particularly fascinating. There was one of the people from hell talking to one of the people from heaven who kind of acted as their guide, some of the saints would come down and say, you know, try to get him to stay. And this one spirit of this lady who had died and gone to hell wanted to get into heaven so she could see her husband. And while they were on the earth, uh, this woman had had sort of a twisted, perverted, controlling kind of love for her husband. It wasn't a, a wholesome kind of thing. And now that she had a chance to stay in heaven, she wanted to stay in heaven. But the only reason she wanted to stay in heaven was so that she could continue that twisted, perverted kind of relationship with her husband. And in that conversation that Lewis thought up, the, the saint said to that, per, that lady, listen, the reason to come to heaven is not to see your husband, it's to see God. You'll see the face of God. But you know what? That lady didn't stay because that's not what she wanted. That isn't what she wanted. Nothing shows the depravity of mankind like people who refuse the love of God Amen. and prefer instead to go to hell. Now, I want to go to heaven. I think most of you do too. But I'll tell you something. I, I don't want to go to heaven necessarily only because you all are going to be there. And that's going to be fine too. But I want to go to heaven because in heaven is the one who loved me and sent his son, gave his son to die for me. Amen. 